Good morning. Welcome to live from Glenner U Product Forum. Today we'll hear from Guido Hunziker on managing low Earth orbit radiation impacts in interconnect wire harnessing. Please use the ask a question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard to ask questions at any time during the presentation. And now here's Guido. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our talk on radiation and products that we have developed over time to handle radiation in space. Uh, my name is Guido Hunziker. I'm responsible for research and development at Plein Air, and uh, I'm going to be presenting this uh, session for the next 40 minutes. If you have any questions during the talk, you can use your dashboard and ask them. Somebody will be able to respond to them either live or at a later point uh, in time. So the first thing we need to talk about in this presentation, obviously, is where the radiation is, come from, is coming from, what it's made out of, how it impacts a spacecraft, and how it behaves depending on where the spacecraft is located, both in time as well as in space, literally. Uh, we'll end with a summary of all the strategies that we have successfully deployed over time in space missions and how they apply to the Glen Eyre product family. So the radiation in general that we're dealing with is entirely emanating from the sun. There are a few exceptions to that where a small proportion of the radiation comes from the power source that's on board of a satellite, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to limit the focus on exclusively the radiation that comes from the sun. And obviously, the further you are from the sun, the less uh, pronounced these effects will be. So the first question is, what, what is the radiation from the sun? What, what is it that we're concerned about? And generally, you can separate out what the sun puts out into two categories of particles, ones that have charge. So those would be electrons, protons, or alpha particles, and particles that are neutral, either gamma rays, x-rays, or generally radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation, or neutrons. The first thing to know is when a particle is charged, like an electron or a proton, it tends to be absorbed very quickly because it interacts strongly with the materials, and so Shielding against a charged particle is a relatively easy task. It's typically achieved with a very thin layer of aluminum foil. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But any thin amount of metal will successfully shield against charged particles. The neutral particles are a little bit more complicated and are more difficult to shield against. Photons, which can have different amounts of energy, will penetrate deeper into the materials depending on how much energy they have. And neutrons will interact with the core of the atoms, the nuclei, and can also damage, in particular, uh, they're of concern for semiconducting materials, so all the electronics on board. The most common effect that we see and the reason we are calling most of the radiation, ionizing radiation, is the Compton effect. So what that is, in very simple terms, is a photon or a bit of electromagnetic energy hits an atom or a molecule, collides, quote unquote, with an electron, and kicks it out into space. So what's left behind is a positively charged atom and a recoil electron that's floating around somewhere, and that's going to either stick to something else or just um, vanish into space. So we are left with a positive charge on the spacecraft, if this is a spacecraft, or a positive charge in the atmosphere, if it's a dilute atmosphere in, uh, in the vicinity of the Earth, and lots of electrons. The reason it's so important is this uh, effect is the first thing that happens when radiation from the sun hits our atmosphere. So our atmosphere gets more and more diluted as we go further away from the Earth. And what's left there gets hit pretty hard by different uh, energies of electron or photons. So what we have is um, in our ionosphere, we have infrared radiation, we have visible radiation, we have X-ray, we have gamma rays. They all come 
and interact or don't interact with what's there. Obviously, the visible part of the spectrum makes it through pretty well. That's why we have we can see the sunlight on the Earth. But there's other uh, spectral content from the sun, solar radiation which interact much more strongly and therefore get blocked in our atmosphere. Now, this blockage doesn't come for free, obviously. What happens up there is there is chemical reactions, electronic reactions that happen as a result of the interaction of these um, high energy photons with the particles that are out there, or the molecules that are out there. Once they have interacted, you're left with chemical compounds that can be fairly aggressive. And for instance, I show here, one of the most common things you'll hear about is atomic oxygen, uh, which is the most common uh, element found in the upper atmosphere. And atomic oxygen is very aggressive against the materials that are on the spacecraft. So when you um, orbit for years and years and years in an atmosphere of reactive oxygen, obviously you need to pick materials that can uh, withstand that constant uh, attack from this. So you have a form of corrosion actually in space, even though it's a very dilute atmosphere. Over time, materials do degrade as a result of these interactions with the oxygen. Of course, if you're on the dark side of the Earth, if you're in the shadow, uh, then you don't have that problem. So it only happens uh, a proportion of the time. If you're in lower orbit, it's typically about a quarter of the time of the satellite if you're right on the equator. Um, if you're in a polar orbit, you're constantly in the sun, so you'll always be subjected to that atmosphere. Geostationary orbit, I just mentioned for reference, they only have less than 1% of their lifetime spent in the shadow of the Earth. So, so far, um, things are pretty simple. The, what, what we have to remember is most of the radiation comes from the sun. There's two kinds. It's either neutral or it's charged. If it's charged, it's fairly easy to absorb with a, a foil, typically an aluminum foil. If it's not charged, then we have to look at more details of how it interacts. Um, then what we've discussed is also the fact that one of the bigger problems that we have near the Earth is not directly the radiation from the sun, but what it does to the dilute atmosphere that is still present when you're orbiting on lower Earth orbits. And then we had a brief uh, comment about satellites that live in the shadows, obviously, or that spend a considerable amount of time in the shadow and which are not subjected as much to that ionized atmosphere. So now um, things get a little more complicated, unfortunately. There's two big um, aspects that we have to cover in order to fully understand uh, the problem of the rugged environment that our connectors are subjected to in space. The first one is the radiation from the sun is not constant. So the sun, emits most of its light and particles from the surface. And the surface of the sun is actually very active. It's almost like um, the surface atmosphere on the earth where you have weather patterns. Sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's raining. Similarly, the sun emits different amounts of radiation and different amounts of particles depending on the activity we've got going. And then the second really important aspect is the particles that are left. So this atomic oxygen, these electrons, unfortunately, they get trapped with the magnetic field that prevails around the Earth. So if the Earth had no magnetic field, this radiation would just come right through and impact our atmosphere. But because we have this pretty strong magnetic field, it acts as a trap. So it shields us from some of the charged particles that come from the sun or that result from the sun's radiation interaction with the atmosphere. This was something that was discovered by an American, American scientist called James Van Allen. And the, the regions where these particles get trapped are called the Van Allen belts. Uh, this was something that was discovered in 1958. One of the first science missions in space was to verify the presence of these belts. And I have a brief video here that shows how these um, radiate these uh, Van Allen belts 
form. What we've got here is a little animation where you see that there's this wiggly particle that basically goes back and forth following the lines of the magnetic field of the Earth. So what happens is when those lines get closer to each other, it acts like a mirror and the particle bounces back and forth. And so once a particle is caught in these Van Allen belts, it can just bounce around there for a long, long time and escape only very occasionally or slowly, which means in these areas over time, you have a fairly large amount of charged particles that just keep bouncing back and forth. And if your satellite constantly rotates through uh, these zones, which have a lot of charged particles, well, that's going to have an impact on the spacecraft, and we need to consider that. Now, here on this slide, you can see a beautiful three-dimensional diagram of where these Van Allen belts are located. Basically, they follow the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, and there's areas which are more dense, so there's an inner uh, Van Allen belt, which is really important when you're in lower orbit or just a little bit beyond lower orbit. And then there's an outer belt, which is really important if your satellite is going to be in a geostationary orbit. So unfortunately, the two most interesting orbits that we use around the Earth are very close to the Van Allen belt. So we have to consider uh, what happens there in order to design the right uh, materials and the right um, grounding structures into our spacecraft. Uh, just a brief word on radiation measurement units. Um, ionizing radiation or the amount of radiation that hits a spacecraft is measured by the amount of energy deposited in a certain amount of mass. So it's a very intuitive um, way to measure is like how much energy did this radiation dump into the material that we have. So that's measured in grays, that's the scientific measurement, or typically in the colloquial world, we use the rad which, or the mega rad, which you might have seen before. Um, that's the amount of energy deposited per unit mass. You can also uh, see in specifications of fluence, which is the amount of electromagnetic power that flows into a surface, or a particle count per angle unit which is typically what's being used when you talk about neutron uh, impacts. So countless uh, spacecraft have gone out and measured how much uh, charged particles and how much radiation we have in the Van Allen belts. And just like on Earth, you make weather forecasts. We have models, computer models, that will predict how much radiation and how many charged particles of life a spacecraft is going to see over its lifetime. And just like the weather, it has its uh, inaccuracies. So uh, you can have um, very wide ranges of predictions. If you design a spacecraft for a certain amount of radiation, depending on what the sun activity looks like, you can have very large fluctuations in lifespan for a spacecraft. And that's illustrated in this slide. Next, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what are all these effects going to be once you have a spacecraft out there. And this slide is a really beautiful illustration of some of the things that we need to worry about. Uh, the first thing, of course, is you're depositing charge, right? You have these electrons that are floating around, they bounce, they get absorbed, and you end up with a negative charge because it was an electron. Um, if it's a metal, that electron will tend to travel to a ground surface. If there's no ground surface, then that metal will gradually build up a charge. And there's a real risk that over time, the charge will be so large that you'll have an arc discharge or a voltage difference that's so big that you get an arcing effect, either on the surface of the material or in the dilute atmosphere between the materials. And that will result in catastrophic damage because you can't predict where it's going to happen. And it could be um, related to a very sensitive piece of electronics. Um, if the material that is getting hit is dielectric, non-conductive, then too, the plastic or the dielectric material we're talking about will slowly but surely accumulate a charge. And if it reaches a point where there's enough charge, it will want to dump that somewhere. So if there's a nearby conductor 
it will zap over and again create some real problems with the spacecraft performance. So we need to have a strategy on how to deal with surfaces that charge up as the spacecraft travels through space. Then there is the obvious material degradation. So higher energy protons tend to have a negative impact on the solar panels and the plastic or the dielectric materials will get damaged because over time they will have broken bonds because these electrons got kicked out, for instance, to add cones and effects. So those are some of the um, material physical processes that happen. Now for electronics, um, there's another layer of complexity that gets added because you have to consider what happens to the electrical properties of your integrated circuit as it gets showered by radiation. And that's a subject that we've studied in detail for our actives material, uh, for our actives products, for our media converters, our opera electronic transceivers, um, because obviously they need to function in the presence of all this radiation. They need to have uh, flawless and no errors in their processing even though they're being irradiated constantly uh, as the spacecraft operates in its mission. So that's a different case study because we're not really looking for an aging process, although there's aging happening as well, but it's strictly what's the performance going to be of our electronics while it's being subjected to all this radiation. So we're going to start with uh, discussion about what do we do about the charged particles and the radiation that we see in space. So the first rule or the first uh, principle is we try to avoid having the outside of our spacecraft covered in non-conductive material. What you want to have is you always want to have the outer skin of your spacecraft made out of something that's conductive. It doesn't have to be very conductive. It can be a slow bleeder of electrons, basically whatever accumulates on its surface needs to be led to the ground structure um, of the spacecraft. Which brings us to the second important point is you want to have all your structures grounded together. So you don't want to have uh, a metallic or a dielectric structure that is sitting floating on its own out there collecting charge and then over time basically begging to have an arc and to discharge and disrupt electronics or even uh, damage some of the, the, the other functions of the aircraft. So um, leaky surface layers for dielectrics and if it's a conductive material then you want to have a ground network or a good grounding path for all these um, for all these charges that build up over time. Now if you want to protect the inside of your spacecraft. One of the most common way to do that is basically to use an aluminum shield. And I mentioned that charged particles are very easy to catch with an aluminum shield. It's also true for a lot of the radiation, so the gamma rays, the photons that impact the spacecraft. And this graph here shows uh, how powerful just a little bit of aluminum shielding will do in terms of reducing the amount of radiation or charged particles that will impact your spacecraft. The second strategy is, of course, if you have an exposed material, you want to choose something that is relatively inert uh, or, or unaffected by the, the shower of uh, radiation that's going to hit it. So epoxy resin, kapton, peak, which is not listed here, but it's about as good as kapton, somewhere in between epoxy and kapton, those are really good materials to have on the outside because they're very resistant to radiation. And here you see I'm using the megarad unit, which is the amount of energy per unit mass that this material can take without being damaged. The weak materials obviously are the electronics. So you can't have exposed electronics um, for very long in this environment. So you want to have an aluminum box, you want to have something around it so that you can bring down the dose that will actually get all the way to your, uh, your circuitry. The next step is on the outside of your spacecraft, you want to pick materials that have a track record. So like I mentioned, for low Earth orbit, there's actually a certain amount of 
chemical aggressivity out there because you have this atomic oxygen that's floating around. So if you just have unplated aluminum, over time that aluminum will oxidize and it will switch from being a conductive material to being an insulator because aluminum oxide is non-conductive. And that aluminum oxide over time will start pick up charges. So now you have what used to be a very well grounded aluminum shell that becomes a non-conductive surface that can accumulate charge. But that's very undesirable, obviously. And that's part of the reason why gold is such a popular finish for all the exposed connectors on a spacecraft, because gold is very inert and it doesn't react very easily with oxygen and therefore it doesn't build a layer of insulating material on the surface over time in the orbit. The strategy that we do we employ for our electronics, and I made a brief reference to that, is basically testing. So what we do is we subject our transceivers while they're running to all these exotic particles and we watch what happens. We watch both the errors that they produce, if any, and for the most part, it's none for reasonable environments. And we also watch if before and after, when we give them a total amount of data, those that represents a space mission, if there is any degradation in performance that's resultant from this exposure to, uh, to radiation. So um, a slightly different strategy, it's, uh, it's really by validation, by empirical validation, because we buy components from vendors and we just don't typically receive a spec sheet that says here's how much radiation this thing can take. So it's a lot simpler, although not cheaper, um, to just expose the entire unit in an intelligent way and then we can come up with some reasonable expected lifetimes or radiation resistant numbers. Um, Fiber optics is also uh, increasingly uh, deployed in space. Uh, there's also strategies for dealing with fibers in space. Many missions uh, will require special optical fibers that are designed for space. Uh, what happens in space is when you subject the optical fiber to some of the radiations, it gets dark. So the, the insertion loss increases in some instances in the optical fiber. And when we select the proper materials in our glass fibers, we can negate this effect and basically have an intact transmission. Now that's not always a big problem because obviously you're not traveling hundreds of miles in an optical fiber when you're on a spacecraft. The lengths are typically very short, but it is a consideration and some systems will require special fibers to be used in order to prevent problems with fiber darkening due to radiation. In our circuit boards, we have special coatings. So some of this radiation makes it through and we still need to be able to bleed it off. So what the strategy here is we put a very slightly conductive coating on the surface of our PCBs that are tied to ground, these uh, surfaces, that do not interfere with the function, the electric function of the of the board, but that will capture uh, any excess charge that might deposit on the surface and prevent uh, arcing from happening on the on the circuit board itself. In general, the rule of thumb is uh, Faraday cages are very powerful in order to prevent um, any spurious electromagnetic radiation to interfere with your electronics, and that remains true for space. And so. The number one rule is pick small connectors because that's usually the biggest hole in your Faraday cage. And of course, Glen Air is extremely well endowed in options for you to use in your, uh, in your IO air connects, which is typically where the breach happens. Uh, another strategy is to use ground plane connectors. So this is an example of a Speedmaster in a connect which has an ethernet lines and in between each contact, instead of having a, an insulating material, we have a ground plane. So that basically seals off the entire aperture of the connector. Some customers use EMI filter connectors. The filter connectors in the ceramic array has a lot of ground planes. So in effect, from an electromagnetic standpoint, it looks like it's a shield. So your uh, radiation will be uh, 
attenuated considerably when it has to travel through the filter array itself. That's another really good strategy. I have included the transient voltage suppression connectors because, like I mentioned, you're always concerned when you design a spacecraft about having discharge events. It may be that for some reason that you didn't foresee a surface gets all charged up because you, you've traveled through a huge cloud of electrons. And if you have some really critical lines that don't, that don't can't handle a discharge very well, you can put, protect those with transient voltage suppression diodes. And that's a, an example that has been deployed successfully. Um, for back shells, if you just have a right angle back shell on the tail of your connector, that's another way to basically close off the line of sight, which is a, a very effective technique for, for some forms of radiation. Another big aperture that needs to be covered in our quote-unquote Faraday cage is the programming ports. So often you'll have fairly sophisticated electronics or instruments on a spacecraft, and before you launch it, you want to give it one last test. And so you need to be able to talk to this instrument with a cable from the ground through a port that can access all the critical functions. But then when you launch, you want to be able to disconnect that cable and not leave that hole exposed. So what we uh, offer for those customers is for every connector series, for every connector size, we can build a special either a shorting can or a capping, port, a capping lid, which basically shorts out the pin field and prevents any uh, unwanted um, effect that will result. Obviously, it's because it's a programming port, it's very delicate. You don't want to have any signals coming in through there and interfering with the function. The wires are part of the Faraday cage, meaning inside your wire you have signals, and that signal wants to be surrounded by a ground layer. And that's obviously prime terrain for our lightweight braids, armalite, amber strand, uh, silver, copper, tin copper, whatever the customer uh, will be uh, selecting, although we do recommend uh, Amber Strand and Armalite, obviously, because they're the lightest options out there right now. Also important, uh, very popular in space, is we have a version of Armalite that's silver plated, and that's uh, been developed specifically for a space customer. We talked about this uh, slightly dissipative or slightly conductive outer layer on um, dielectric surfaces. We have in our dielectric cable. Uh, product offering, we have a version that is uh, conductive, that has a slightly conductive outer surface, and that would be suitable to bleed charge. And this concludes my presentation for now. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions and for your comments. I just want to spend one more minute to uh, make you aware that we have sessions of this type almost every week, and you see in front of you the schedule of the next upcoming solution seminars that uh, various experts in their fields will be presenting. Thank you very much.